Thanks for listening to this lesson on conditioning, which has to do with how error is magnified in computational problems. So we say that a problem is well conditioned uh, if small perturbations um, in the input data lead to small perturbation in the output of the problem. So if you think about a matrix, it means like, I don't know, you're calculating something about a matrix, maybe it's eigenvalues. And if you change one entry a little bit, you might expect or hope that the eigenvalues just change a little bit. And if that's true, we say that the problem's well conditioned. Um, the problem is ill conditioned if a small perturbation in the input data leads to a large perturbation in the output of the problem. And a, a related concept is this thing called stability, which has to do with the behavior of a numerical algorithm on a computer. So this business, right, this, this had nothing to do with calculating on a computer. Um, that's I gave an example about a matrix, and we were just concerned with the inherent property of the matrix. Um, when we were talking about stability, we're specifically also thinking about computers. So we're going to define two things called forward and backward errors, and you may have seen them before, but maybe not with this verbiage. So we're going to do this first in the context of root finding. So rewind to earlier in the course when we were talking about bisection method and Newton's method and things like this. Um, and we were solving uh, f of x equals zero. So we're gonna let r be the exact solution and ra, our approximate solution that comes out of our numerical method. Um, and so the, the forward error is defined as the difference between the exact answer and the computed answer. So you find an approximation of the root, the distance between that and the real root, that's the forward error here, okay? Now, the computed answer, RA, is the solution to some perturbed problem. So to try to make this clearer, um, suppose that we're solving f of x equals 0, and we find that R, the root, is approximately equal to RA, right? And you take that value of the root, and you plug it into the function, and you find that you don't get 0, because your root's an approximation, you get 0.0001. The point is that this approximate root is the exact solution to what we call a perturbed problem. And the perturbed problem is f of x minus 0 0.0001 equals 0. Ra is exactly a root of that. So that's what's being said um, in this bullet point here. And what the backward error is, it's the difference between um, sort of the original problem and the perturbed problem. In other words, it's what you get when you plug the approximate root into the perturbed problem, which should be zero, and what you get when you plug the approximate root into the original problem, which is not zero, it's hopefully something close to zero. So again, um, I've written down the forward error here and the backward error here, and this is just a numerical example on a cubic polynomial where the exact root is at two-thirds, and through some uh, root-finding algorithm, we determine that the Approximate root is 0 0.6666641. So the forward error is just the distance between this and this, which is this number here. It's on the order of 10 to the minus 6. And the backward error, well, it's good news. If you take this number, RA, and you plug it in on a computer, you actually uh, get out 0 uh, because it's less than machine epsilon. So that's good news. Um, the Condition number, um, informally, is defined as the maximum error magnification. So if you think about, uh, I like taking this um, statement that's written down here and writing it as forward over backward uh, is less than or equal to condition number. And it says that the condition number is the maximum error magnification, the maximum possible ratio of forward error to backward error. And what that means is that if the condition number is big, then small changes in the problem, meaning little backwards error, lead to big errors in the solution, forwards error. Um, and so a, a problem with a large condition number is ill-conditioned, uh, and there's no official number. We don't know what the threshold is, right? We can just say things are better or worse conditioned than each other. Um, it's kind of like when my kid tells me that something is large, I always say, in comparison to what? Um, which is why you should never have a mathematician for a parent. So the condition number for root finding is proportional to 
1 divided by the derivative at the root. We're going to show that momentarily. And um, what this sort of suggests is that the conditioning can be different around different roots. Okay, so let's try a little bit of math here um, and talk in more detail about conditioning of the root finding problem. Um, we're going to study the usual problem and we're going to make a small change. So this is the perturbed problem, okay? Um, it's like you're not finding the roots of f of x anymore, you're finding the roots of f of x plus a slight function perturbation, okay? And the root of the perturbed problem, so the root of the original problem is r, and the root of this perturbed problem we're going to say is some distance away, r plus delta r. And just taking that and plugging it into the previous line, that means f of r plus delta r plus epsilon g of the same thing has to equal zero. And then we're going to expand in one degree uh, Taylor polynomials. So the f term becomes these two terms here, and the g term becomes these two terms here, and everything else is order delta r squared or smaller. Um, if we hope delta r is small, or if we imagine it as small, we can ignore this. Um, and... Uh, we can uh, rearrange this equation, um, keeping the delta r terms on one side and factoring them here, um, and then keeping the uh, zeroth order terms, putting them on the other side with a minus sign. And of course, uh, f of r is zero by assumption, because r is a root. So if epsilon is small, and if um, f prime of r is not equal to zero, we can do the following. We can try to isolate delta r, and so we can divide each side by this quantity, um, and this yields this expression here, and then since we said epsilon is small, we're going to ignore this term here in the denominator. So this shows us that the forward error, right, which is the, um, the change uh, in the root from the true value of the root, we've estimated with this amount here, and we can ask what's the ratio of the forward error to the backward error. And that would be um, the forward error is minus epsilon g of r over f prime of r, as we just described. And the backwards error would just be epsilon g of r. Um, and so if you take the ratio of those things, the epsilon g of r's cancel out and you get, um, oh, and I should take, be taking magnitudes of these things because we just care about their sizes, so we get 1 divided by f prime of r. And that tells us something about how error propagates from the input to the output. And now we're going to talk about a bunch of similar ideas, but in the context of matrices, uh, and, and thinking about eventually solving ax equals b. So... This is a refresher on the definition of the matrix P norm. It gives the maximum relative expansion by A, as we discussed uh, in a previous video. Um, and so one of the key properties is that um, the P norm of the vector AX is less than or equal to the P norm of the matrix A times the P norm of the vector X. That's sometimes useful to know. So we're going to talk about error magnification solving this problem. Suppose we solve it on a computer and we get an approximate answer, which we're going to call x sub a. So the forward error is the difference between x sub a and whatever is the true solution x. The backwards error is the difference between what we should get back on the right-hand side of the equation, which is b, and what we actually get back, which is axa. Now, when solving matrix problems, we, by convention, talk about the relative error. So we're going to look at b minus ax, uh, the norm of b minus axa, divided by the norm of b. So it's like the length of how far we were off divided by the length of what we were supposed to get back. It's a relative error. And then the same thing for the relative forward error. It's just the difference between the two solutions. Take their norm and divide by the... Uh, the norm of the exact solution. And so error magnification is defined as um, relative backward error times error magnification equals relative forward error, so dividing. Error magnification is the relative forward divided by the relative backward error. It's a very similar concept to what we were just talking about. And so the condition number of a matrix is the lowest upper bound on the error magnification. 
right? And so we sometimes write it kappa of A, where A is the matrix we're talking about, or cond A. And it just says you could think of the um, error magnification for all sorts of different problems, AX equals B for different Bs, and the condition number is the lowest upper bound um, you can get for error magnification. And so there's a useful theorem um, that says for an n by n matrix A, the condition number of A is the norm of A times the norm of A inverse. Um, and that, of course, depends on what norm you choose. Um, computing inverses is hard. Many algorithms give a cheap estimate of the condition number without computing it exactly. There's a link that I hope works. If it doesn't, you can ask me to a function that computes it. And you can also look at R's built-in function, which is kappa. So a good thing to try to do is just get into R and try to calculate the condition numbers for these various P norms. Now, of course, you're wondering, why is this the condition number? Um, you can look at various sources. I'm not going to go over that in the, um, in the video here. But if you're one of my students, you're very welcome to ask me about this in class. So let's talk about some properties of the condition number. Um, it's defined as greater than or equal to 1. Um, and it obeys this kind of inequality where the condition number of a product is less than or equal to the product of the condition numbers. We use this vocabulary of well-conditioned or ill-conditioned, but again, there's no cutoff for when a matrix is in one category versus the other. And as I mentioned on the last slide, condition number depends on the underlying norm here. So um, this statement here is just um, substituting some uh, definitions of norms. Um, but really, what I want you to have in your head is it's just the maximum relative expansion by A divided by the minimum relative expansion by A. So you take a matrix X, uh, so you take a matrix A, and you hit a vector x with it, and x could expand a little, or it could expand a lot, and if you take the ratio of the most divided by the least, that's the condition number. If the condition number is very large, we say that a is close to singular. And so for two by two matrices, um, what it turns out this gives is the ratio of the longest principal semi-axis to the shortest principal semi-axis, right? So you can imagine that, you know, here, um, this matrix maps the black circle to this red ellipse, and you can take the ratio of the longer semi-axis to the shorter one, and they're pretty close to each other. So that tells you geometrically that this is a well-conditioned matrix. You know, um, in uh, contrast here, this matrix maps the black circle to the red ellipse, and it has this very long semi-axis and this very short one. If you take their ratio, you get a pretty big number, so that's more poorly conditioned. This one is even more poorly conditioned. I think it's helpful to do a numerical example. We're going to solve this problem, AX equals B. And if you were to use a computer to find the condition number, um, you would find it's 1.25 times 10 to the fourth. Um, the exact solution to this system of equations is 1 minus 1, but we're going to consider two approximate solutions in the 2 norm. So we're going to pretend this is a solution from one numerical algorithm, and I don't know, maybe this is a solution from a different one. Um, and what we can do is calculate the error vector. Uh, how far off is this solution from the true solution, 1 minus 1? That's these numbers here. And then we can say what's the magnitude of that forward error. That just means take the length of the vector. We get these two numbers. And then we can say let's calculate the relative forward error. So we would be, we would be dividing um, this number by the magnitude of the true solution, um, magnitude of this vector here. Uh, and we get this number here. Similarly, over here, we get a much smaller relative forward error. And then we can think about backward errors. So recall that when we plug this vector uh, into the matrix A, when we do matrix multiplication by A, we should get back out exactly B. But since it's an approximation, we don't. So on the left-hand side, we get out this vector. Um, and you can notice that it's you know close to this vector here, but it's not the same. So you can calculate the vector that's their difference. That's these two. Um, you can calculate the length of that vector. Um, so that would be the backwards error. 
and then you can calculate the relative backwards error, and that's these two numbers here. Then you can calculate the error magnification, which is the ratio of the relative forwards error, this one, to the relative backwards error, this one. And on the left, it's 1.8 times 10 to the third. On the right, it's 1.6 times 10 to the first. So that's fine. It's two different problems. We should have gotten two different answers. This is from two different numerical methods. The thing to remember is that the condition number bounds the error magnification. So both of these numbers are less than the actual condition number. The condition number is defined as the maximum possible error magnification. Um, but also, this example is just a good... Um, Reminder that a small residual or a small backwards error does not imply a small error in the solution. So, like, what does that mean? Look here. The residual, the distance we were off from producing the vector b, was really, really small, 0.000206. And yet, the forwards error was really big. It was 1.85. Or if you look at the estimated solution, it's actually not close to one negative one at all. And if you take nothing away, nothing else away from this lecture, that's what ill conditioning looks like. A small residual doesn't mean that you've actually done a good job finding the solution to the problem. All right, thanks for listening.